morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the webinar today. Our topic is documentation of therapy services, which will be presented by one of our medical directors, Dr. Mark Durden. My name is Christine Oberfell. I am a provider outreach and education consultant here at National Government Services. And I will be the organizer for today's session. Now, this is our standard disclaimer. You're going to see it in any of our presentations that we give. And it just informs you the information that's being presented is current at the time it's developed. But as you know, the Medicare program is ever changing. So please be sure to stay on top of changes and updates and so subscribe to the CMS listservs as well as National Government Services email updates and visit both the CMS website and the NGS website on a regular basis requirements for those. So at this time, I would like to go ahead and turn it over to our speaker, Dr. Durden, to begin the topic presentation. Dr. Durden, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. If you can go to the first slide, or actually would be what, slide 10. Um, the, I'm going to uh, provide the presentation today, hopefully in a circular loop, to try to give you a complete view of the requirements for the documentation of therapy services. To start that loop, I would like to start with the discussion of what is reasonable and necessary. When therapy services are being provided, it is important to be able to document what is being done is necessary. Uh, and the example I could use for this would be uh, if somebody was needing electrical stimulation to a joint, um, what is the problem that is being seen with that joint that requires the electrical stimulation? So if it was necessary and you were dealing with a synovitis or an arthritis a condition and you're trying to use electrical stimulation to mitigate pain, then it would be important to be able to provide all of the findings regarding that uh, issue of pain or synovitis, not just simply indicating that there's pain, but that there's more information out there to show that the electrical stimulation to a joint is reasonable. Now, let me give you an example. Let's say it, your electrical stimulation is being applied to a shoulder joint, but in the extreme, uh, case of pain, there's a fracture, or if there's a, a calcific tendonitis, um, those forms of pain would not be necessary and nor reasonable to be given electrical stimulation. Certainly, the beneficiary would have pain in the joint, but the, the, the reason for the electrical stimulation would not be necessary because it's not necessary to put electrical stimulation on a joint that has a fracture. So it is important to start in all documentation thought processes that to work with the issue of necessary. Then I would say that the, the next uh, process in thinking as you're going around this loop of understanding is the, the next thing to think about is, are the services that you're providing, are they reasonable? Now, reasonable meaning that they are safe and effective. And effective kind of, in my mind, goes back to, again, the necessary. So, again, if it was a calcific tendonitis in a shoulder joint and you're providing electrical stimulation, that may or may not be effective for doing it. And so, also, like in the extreme example, if someone has an ingrown toenail, doing range of motion activities of the shoulder isn't going to be effective for treating that, that body part in the, in the leg. So things, that I'm not using the extreme examples, but think of things as being safe and effective. Then it's not experimental. Uh, so in, in the day when I was a, a practicing physiatrist, uh, anodyne therapy was uh, being used a lot for the treatment of neuropathy. Um, I think it's been pretty well shown at this point that anodyne therapy is not uh, effective, but also it is still experimental. It hasn't followed any of the, 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 the 
uh, randomized clinical trials to show that it is a re that anything that's not only reasonable because it's not shown to be anything more than experimental. And then also and to meet the category of reasonable it has to be reasonable in the type, intensity, duration, and frequency. And we're going to get into that a, a little bit also when we talk about the plan of care. But the first part of course is if the type of therapy is occupational therapy or physical therapy, then the intensity of that therapy, uh, the, let's say the number of minutes in a day or the duration of that therapy or the frequency of that therapy two times a week for three weeks, uh, those are things that need to be assessed. Um, I know that it is common practice to say everybody gets three times a week for five times a week for um, 12 weeks or whatever. Uh, I would caution that uh, boilerplate or rule of thumb or top, uh, typical documentation standards are are not a, 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 an appropriate way for you to really assess what is going to be reasonable in the uh, assessment of the intensity, duration, and frequency. And last is determining medical necessity is that reimbursement is, is then documented in the IOM that it is based on the beneficiary's unique clinical characteristics. So that is important, in, especially when you're thinking of the documentation of your therapy, because you want to be able to, when it says unique characteristics, these are characteristics that are only seen in this, in this individual. So speaking in global terms that someone had a functional decline uh, is not uh, sufficient documentation when, as me as a reviewer, would look at that because it doesn't give you anything unique about that individual. What is specific in that individual that occurred that therefore uh, rises the therapy levels to being reasonable and necessary? Now, if we can move to slide 11. Uh, I'd like to start talking about the initial documentation that gets placed on paper after the initial thought process of reasonable and necessary has been uh, attained. When you're looking at that pr uh, plan of care, uh, I want to just parenthetically identify that the order is important and having the order is, is important to show that the physician is in uh, in coordination with this uh, treatment plan that's going to be developed. But the plan of care is actually the thing that is uh, very critical. And without meeting all of these criteria that's established in the IOM, the plan of care, therefore, would become invalid. So it was very important to follow this. Now, in this plan of care, the first thing is, is that it needs to be uh, certified by that physician or non-physician practitioner as soon as possible. That's been defined as within 30 days after the initial treatment uh, assessment has been performed or the plan of care has been developed. When it's within that 30 days, it is a timely certification. If it's outside of that 30 days, it is a delayed certification. Now, delayed certification is, uh, has some additional criteria, and it's important to understand the, the, the criteria for that. I, I will simply identify that that's out, outlined in the Medicare Benefit Policy Manual, Chapter 15, Section 220. But that, that's in there because we, we all realize that uh, physicians, and, and I will point the finger at myself, uh, sometimes don't get things back to you despite your best efforts. So there is some reasonable uh, adjustments that are being allowed to be made for that uh, certification to be made, but it is important that you document the diligence of that. So when I go to an ALJ hearing around a, an issue of delayed certification and, or an invalid plan of care, the discussion usually comes down to what is what is documented that has been done to show that the the therapist has made a reasonable effort or done due diligence uh, 
uh, in providing that efforts to get the certification signed. If there is documentation that there was reasonable efforts being made, the, the, it is more likely than not that the, the plan of care will be considered valid. But without that diligence in showing what was done in order to get that certification, it's going to be potentially seen as an invalid plan of care. So if you can go to slide 12, in the plan of care, this documentation has very specific features of it. And I want to address some of these uh, initial features first because they're going to become repetitive as you're already starting to see some of the repetitive language that's there. The first, of course, is the issue of the diagnosis. Um, now, it, when it comes to therapy diagnosis, I recognize that, uh, that that could be different than a physician's diagnosis. So for a physician's diagnosis, they may write in the chart, the beneficiary had a cerebrovascular accident. But to the therapist, it would be that they have a left hemiparesis with a, maybe a complexity of left neglect and spasticity uh, and, a, and different ways of describing it. So the diagnosis that is placed in the chart uh, can be any of the above, but it doesn't have to be a diagnosis that, is, that would be written by a, a, the physician. Also important in the plan of care is the long-term goals. This becomes very important because if a plan of care is changed, it, and a significant change would be considered a change in the long-term goals. So long-term goals are absolutely important for a plan of care. And then as you can see in the documentation of medical necessity and again, continuing with this loop of completeness, the type of therapy, the physical therapy, the, the amount of the therapy, the duration and frequency of the treatment all start to become very important factors because in the initial cognitive assessment of determining reasonable and necessary, it's now being articulated in the plan of care of what those findings were and what the amount, frequency, and duration of that therapy will be regarding the unique clinical characteristics of this particular patient. So if we go to the next slide, which is 13, then it, I would like to talk a little bit about this, now that you're establishing the evaluation or the plan of care, which can be the same document, of course, as you know. The documentation of this course of therapy needs to be assessed with the objective findings that the beneficiary has. Here again, I would admonish you to avoid generalization of terms such as decreased range without giving specific range measurements, or they, they have um, a decline in function, or they have decreased strength, or they have loss of balance. Those are very general and nonspecific terms. Rather, I would recommend using objective findings, the specific range of motion that has changed. And even if you're using subjective assessments, and we all do this when we work with patients, we'd work with subjective assessments. But it's like old Ronald Reagan said, you, you trust, but you verify. So when you're dealing with subjective assessments, they, the beneficiary may be giving uh, Act, um, activities that are well beyond their capacity or what they were beyond, or even that they are minimizing what their capacity is. Uh, so for example, I had a, a, a patient that says, I never got out of bed, I've never been out of bed for the last three days, and yet I know they've gone to the bathroom. So their, their subjective assessment was is that they had never gotten out of bed, but in point of fact, they really had gotten out of bed. and they And so, Therefore, the development of this plan of care that, and the evaluation was based on their statements, but recognizing that there was some potential inaccuracies or un misunderstandings of what their capacities really were, uh, self-misunderstanding. Also, I believe it's important to emphasize that only a clinician can perform these evaluations 
reevaluations, assessments, and developing this plan of care. That occurs occasionally as well with uh, evaluations that I have taken to ALJ hearings where a therapy assistant has been performing these reevaluations. And I would admonish you that that is not an appropriate way to document it. It is the clinician or the qualified therapist that is to perform these evaluations. It also leads to the issue of progress notes. Uh, after the 10 treatment sessions that have been uh, employed and the treatment notes have been written, a progress note should be written. When a progress note is written, it, and it indicates in the IOM, it shall be written by the clinician. Again, this is that if there is a therapy assistant that's writing these progress notes and in EMR systems, you cannot tell who did what when the initial evaluation. And so it is important that even though you may have a, uh, a therapy assistant doing an activity, if it is not clearly documented what activity the clinician did, and if the notes are not shown to be written by the clinician, it is has the potential on review to show that that progress note would not be considered valid because you can't tell if it's just simply a co-signed note that was written by the therapy assistant and then co-signed by the therapist, or was it all or some of the initial evaluations and objective measurements then done by the therapy assistant, but the real work was all done by the clinician. In EMR, it is very difficult to ascertain the difference, and so I would admonish you to be careful in that uh, progress note writing and that the, make sure that it is very clear that it was written by the clinician. Also, when doing these evaluation progress notes and now that even the treatment notes, it's important to document all of the factors that are impacting their rate of recovery. The contractor is not asking for you to write a novel in order to sufficiently document all the aspects of their care. But it is important to integrate and to weave together the important aspects of the care that is being provided so that you can incorporate in issues that are related to their illness and or medical care that is being provided and also incorporate that into the social reporting as well as the functional status of the individual. So if someone is being provided with uh, outpatient physical therapy um, in, the, in the nursing facility under the uh, Medicare, uh, well, either it's going to be Medicare A or B. So the the, the documentation of that is going to fall under the outpatient reporting, or if it's an outpatient therapy program, it's important to weave into the, that current situation of what the patient is in. So if they're in a facility or they're at home, or they're, and what are the dynamics of the home environment that are unique? And to that example, I would give you, there is uh, it not in frequent opportunities when I've had to review records is that someone will say that the beneficiary needs to walk 50 feet, but there's no intertwining of that relationship of why do they need to walk 50 feet? If the goal, the long-term goal is to walk 50 feet or 150 feet uh, and they want to become household ambulator, uh, that may be very reasonable or 15 feet to get to the bathroom. But if you haven't weaved it into the aspects of that the beneficiary needs to get to the bathroom or the kitchen is 50 feet away, then, then you haven't really provided sufficient documentation to indicate why you're establishing that therapy goal of 50 feet. And without the social reporting and the environment of which the beneficiary is in. So it's important to, to weave those together. The last component of this slide I would like to address is the issue of treatment notes. When it comes to treatment notes, I would also admonish you that to record all the treatments that, that are being provided and the skilled interventions that are being provided. It is not just sufficient documentation to provide a log of the build codes that were done, whether it's therapeutic activities, therapeutic exercises, et cetera but rather to provide some additional information about what was actually done during that treatment note and that logs are 
can be important pieces of documentation and it, one way to uh, document things, but simply to rely on a treatment log with the billing codes would be, in, in as, a, as a reviewer, I would see that as insufficient documentation to justify the, the therapy that is being provided because you need to provide both the billing codes as well as the treatments that are being provided. And if you could move to the next slide, I'd like to just briefly close up with this issue of documentation of the plan of care with the fact that uh, certification of this plan of care needs to be uh, dated by the physician or non-physician provider and that that needs to be a legible signature. Uh, there is the program integrity manual that discusses the, the issue of signatures. I would tell you that uh, that's important and that's why we have logs because physicians are notorious in not writing their name very clearly. Uh, but that's not as uh, significant to me, but to make sure, uh, well, it is significant to me. It is not as it rise to the level that I would deny something just because the, the, I can't read the physician signature. It usually is in compilation with other things that I see in the records that are not uh, providing sufficient justification for the therapy that is being provided. When it comes to the, the documentation of the signature as well, uh, I just want to note that the certification does differ from the order because I've had um, therapists on, on ALJ hearings where they say, well, we have an order to do this. And my, my response is that certification of the plan of care is really the, the weighted document that, that shows that the, the, the plan has been not only that the physicians involved in the plan of care, but, the, but that the plan has been certified and the long-term goals have been established. And so just wrapping back up on this is the, the, the certification needs to be done within 30 days of that initial evaluation or the, at least 90 days after the uh, initiation and treatment under this other plan of care if for a recertification. Okay, now if we could move to the next slide, which is now that we have made a discussion or had the discussion and thought process of determining what is reasonable and necessary, as well as developing the appropriate documentation to start the therapy treatments. Now that when you've started the therapy treatments, what constitutes skilled therapy? Um, and I would present to you that this language is general, but I will give you some examples of things that I have seen in documentation and, and hopefully will give you some better understanding of how um, a, a contracting medical director will take a look at this type of activity. So when you look at for skilled therapy services, things are not skilled just because they were performed by a physical therapist or the occupational therapist, but they need to be performed by the physical therapist and occupational therapist in order to be considered skilled. However, so the critical thing that needs to be uh, demonstrated in the documentation is that when therapy is being provided, that it is of a level of complexity and sophistication that can only be done by the qualified therapist. And therefore, it is required to be done by the therapist. So again, uh, one could argue, again, the, let's say we did uh, a modality. Uh, it was ultrasound, diathermy, uh, et cetera. Uh, clearly, those would be activities that could be skilled. But again, the, the first measure that needs to be assessed was, is it reasonable and necessary? And is the documentation showing that that modality is reasonable? Then that could be considered potentially skilled. Also, when you're doing therapeutic exercises or therapeutic activities, those activities have to be of a complexity and sophistication that show that they could only be done by the qualified therapist. And so, in, it is not uncommon that I will see. Uh, for example, a documentation, they'll say that the beneficiaries doing uh, balance activities. And so they're 
uh, throwing a ball and they're doing uh, other activities such as uh, ankle pumps and uh, uh, hamstring stretches and iliotibial band activities um, because all of those are important. But after they've been done for the last 20, 30 sessions of therapy, at what point does those more simple activities, and I call them pre-functional activities, uh, the, the activities of balance, range of motion, uh, strength, endurance, those sort of things, when those type of activities have been done and repetitively done for a long period of time, at what point do they become not sophisticated and complex enough? Well, that's demonstrated in the documentation. And the for, to further explain that is that the documentation needs to show that it requires the expertise, knowledge, judgment, and skills of the therapist to do that. And that it can't be done by a, a therapy assistant or a restorative nursing program or even the patient themselves. How do you demonstrate that? Well, I would present to you that the documentation, for example, of just ambulation activities, if the documentation is simply in indicating the beneficiary ambulated 75 feet and they had a decreased stride length, uh, I would argue that that may, in this in a situation, not be sufficient documentation to show that this type of activity is of a level of complexity or sophistication that could only be done by a qualified therapist because you're really not showing what knowledge, skill, and judgment you're using. Now, if you were the documentation, for example, discussed the genu recurvatum or the Trendelenburg gait patterns or the other types of uh, even cognitive problems that the beneficiary is having as an in the, in the demonstration of their ambulation, that provides, may provide some additional information regarding how that you're demonstrating the, the knowledge, skill, and judgment of the therapist is needing to do this ambulation activity and this repetitive activity that could be, without sufficient documentation, seen as unskilled therapy. And so if you could go to the next slide, I thought I would give you just uh, some examples of these. Now, examples are not intended to be anything more than illustrations to how uh, coverage determinations could be made. But so some, from these examples on slide 16, simply documenting repetitive activities from prior treatment sessions without noting any of the observations that are being done would be examples of insufficient documentation. So if you're documenting the, the, the beneficiary ambulated 100 feet, or if you're documenting that the range of motion of the shoulder improved, or even that it, that let's say the knee range of motion Im improved from, uh, 40 degrees to 50 degrees. And I would argue to you that if you're still less than 90 degrees and certainly less than 120 degrees, you don't have a functional range of motion of that knee. And if it's not a reasonable expectation that you're going to get to a functional point or that there's documentation to indicate why you're working on range of motion of the knee that's at 40 degrees, then that would be an example that just simply doing range of motion to that knee or to that shoulder without showing that you're trying to reach a functional point or the, of some observation of what you're trying to obtain, maybe another example of where it is not skilled therapy. Simply also documenting that there's repetitive verbal cues and therapeutic activities that are being done, for example, with ankle pumps. At a certain point, that just becomes unskilled activities because those are activities that could be done in a restorative nursing program. So that those repeated activities are good examples of, of potential unskilled therapies. Also, 
if you're reporting the beneficiary's performance of an activity without describing the modification of that activity, that is also, to me, a, an example of an opportunity to improve the documentation. So therefore, you would, uh, by simply indicating the, the, the patient tolerated the treatment well, is insufficient documentation to describe really what their performance of the activity was. And so if you're not identifying what is, modifications were made or activities that were being made or changes even in the short-term goals, then that's an example of, uh, of unskilled activities. Also, reporting activities that are not connected with a functional activity or goal. Um, and I see this sometimes in the, in the realm of cognitive stimulation versus cognitive rehabilitation. So if someone has a cognitive impairment, and, and I would just add parenthetically to this thought of cognitive uh, function, that simply having someone say, well, they have an orientation of one, that's sufficient cognition to participate in therapy. I've never read that in any of my uh, therapy literature or in any of the medical literature. Uh, I understand that that may be a position of some uh, therapy uh, individuals, but there's nothing to be supportive of that in the medical literature. But regardless, when you're providing cognitive stimulation, that would be an example of unskilled activities or just cognitive training because it becomes simple and repetitive. It's not connected to a rehabilitation or a functional activity. The key is the functional activity, which then rises that to being a level of cognitive rehabilitation or fu functional improvements. Again, getting back to the example, you know, you need some have somebody walk 15 feet because they need to get to the bathroom and that it is reasonable to work toward that goal. Um, it's also in just indicated that if it's a unskilled activity, if you're just simply writing, uh, you know, you're observing the caregivers, you're not providing any specific education or feedback, or again, the issue is modification and observations that you're seeing or not seeing. If you're not documenting those, that may change the documentation from skilled to unskilled, being viewed as unskilled activities. Now, continuing our circle of understanding and completeness for the documentation of therapy, I would like to talk a little bit about rehabilitative therapy uh, versus maintenance therapy. Rehabilitative therapy is therapy that is provided uh, to improve or to restore someone's to a previous level of health. That is the type of therapy that is typically documented. It is therapy that is um, th the more common form of therapy. Uh, typically, the therapy notes will start with uh, their prior level of function was X, and we're trying to get them back to this prior level of function. It is important in the documentation of rehabilitative therapy to document that the therapy that is being provided is providing objective uh, metrics by which it is being performed. So that, and again, this is a very basic, you know, if someone is improving with a pre-functional activity such as range of motion or a functional activity of uh, transfers from mod assist to min assist, those are objective measurements of what something is being accomplished or how it's being accomplished in the rehabilitative program. It is not reasonable when the rehabilitation potential is insignificant to the relation and duration of the therapy. Let me explain that. When rehabilitation is being provided, uh, and let's say an evaluation is being done of an individual in a hospital and they're going to go to an ERF setting. If the beneficiary was at mod to max assist, it's more likely than not that just on that basic parameter, uh, they may be able to, uh, uh, again, assuming they have expectation of improvement, uh, that that may be a level of, of of complexity that's going to require that 
higher level of rehabilitation therapy. However, if someone was min assist to contact guard assist with their transfers and mobility and such, the, it is more likely than not that they're not going to be a, a candidate for that higher level of rehabilitation therapy such as provided in an earth. So the, the area w- at which they are presenting with, there needs to be that significant rehabilitation potential to improve. So just simply saying, we want to do therapy on someone who's min assist, contact guard assist, to get them back to standby assist, which is a term I understand is not even really used anymore. Um, and I would agree with not being used anymore. That those type of uh, parameters are really not really something that, that may be worth re- uh, starting a rehabilitative therapy program for. So it has to ha- see a significant improvement in function and the, the improvements in function need to be objectively documented. So when it comes to, and if you go to the next slide, it, it really rests on the beneficiary's condition and the potential for that beneficiary to improve in regards to the therapy that is being provided. It also assumes in the documentation that the beneficiary hasn't reached a level of maximal improvement. Someone who has been wheelchair bound uh, and requiring a Hoyer lift, starting a rehabilitation therapy program to work on transfers and ambulation may be a stretch in documenting why someone needs rehabilitative therapy. And you may think that the example I'm using is absurd, but I will tell you that that I have seen these in ALJ hearings. So if someone's at a level of function that they've been at and there's not a reasonable potential for them to improve, there's it, it is very likely that it's not going to be meeting the standard for documentation requirements for rehabilitation potential. Therefore, it really comes down to the fact, is there an expectation that the beneficiary is going to make significant improvements that could be attainable within a reasonable and generally predictable period of time? In the statute, I believe the documentation requirement actually is, is that there has to be material improvement or significant improvement that the beneficiary is going to have. So it, it all rests on the fact that the, of the expectation to improve. Uh, I will give you some caveats of things that, that I have seen that may place the uh, documentation requirements of an expectation in doubt. For example, if you have a beneficiary who has a prior level of function and it is only obtained by subjective means, and you don't know when they were last obtained or or last able to do these particular activities, you don't really know what you're shooting for. Likewise, if someone has been in a therapy program earlier that year, it is reasonable to take a look at those therapy programs and and what they were able to attain that last therapy regimen to to make a reasonable expectation of what they're going to be able to accomplish in this therapy program that would be started uh, perhaps in the same calendar year. Another factor that could take an impact is if someone is variable, not that, and I know that patients are not linear and they don't move from uh, max assist to mod assist to min assist, and then all of a sudden they're modified independent. But rather, if there's variability and that variability persists and they sometimes are able to do things at min assist and other times they're able to do things at max assist and then you're continuing to provide therapy and the goal is for them to be contact guard assist or min assist and they continue to vary between max and min assist for whatever reason there that would be potentially another area to look at that they're not going to have the expectation to make significant improvements within a reasonable period of time because they are continuing to have this variability. It is more likely than not in those type of patients that they'll continue to have that variability regardless of the amount of therapy that is being employed. So therefore, the key is 
is to look for the expectation the, the beneficiary can make the material improvements within that reasonable period of time. And if you could move to the next slide, which is slide 19. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about maintenance therapy. Maintenance therapy is a therapy, and, and I believe you're all familiar with the, the GMO settlement. And that's the clarification that was given by in that settlement by CMS that you don't have to have an improvement standard. But there's no improvement standard if you're providing maintenance therapy. If you're providing rehabilitative therapy, there certainly is an expectation they'll make a reasonable improvement or significant improvements within a reasonable period of time. If you have maintenance therapy, and actually I have just been working again with a, another patient to get maintenance therapy approved by the carrier, uh, it is important in the documentation of maintenance therapy to, to document what functional status that you're trying to maintain or trying to slow the deterioration of the, or prevent the decline in their function. The, the fact is, is that um, it, is, it takes some additional documentation uh, skill in providing this uh, so that you can provide it to, and I, I'm a provider, uh, I wrote the therapy prescription for it, and so I understand what the what and the difficulties were encountered as I was writing the prescription for the maintenance therapy. The thing that needed to be emphasized was, and always emphasized, is that the type of activity that it was being provided by the, the therapist was of a level of complexity that could only be provided by the therapist and not by this patient's mother or another, you know, it's just a caregiver. That is uh, required a lot of additional documentation. It did require additional uh, explanation, particularly of the psychosocial environments that were involved, uh, particularly re regarding the cognitive status of the beneficiary that was being involved, the environment in which he was in. It really required a lot of detailed and interweaving of those uh, understand uh, sorry those factors to help the reviewer understand the medical necessity of skilled therapy. So the deciding factor for maintenance therapy always is related to the skill, is that the, the activities that are being provided by the therapist can only be provided by that qualified therapist. And as I try to point out in, the, in the, some of the previous slides is the fact that you want to really focus in on the unique characteristics, the unique clinical characteristics of that particular beneficiary so that they, um, so you're documenting exactly how and what therapy is needed. Now, if you can go to the next slide, I'd like to continue that thought process a little bit further on the issues of maintenance therapy. The, so on slide 20, the documentation therefore must establish that there's the unique skills of the therapist that are being shown. And you need to show that those therapy skills are preventing slowing or, prevent, uh, or uh, preventing slowing or maintaining that beneficiary's functional status. So the, the example that I had in my life was that I needed to show particular issues of ambulation, the issues of falls, not just the risk of falls, but the actual falls, the characteristics of those falls, the environmental factors that occur with those falls, the, the things that the very specific things that we were doing in the therapy to mitigate and to reduce those those falls themselves and not simply documenting that there was this risk of fall, but things that were actually uh, maintained. Now I also had some opportunities to show that when therapy stopped, that there was the decline in, in very objective measures. And that was very helpful in, in providing information to the reviewer to show that they understood that these type of activities were essential. And because of the complexity of those activities that could only be done by the therapist, therefore that's why they were skilled. 
and that's why maintenance therapy was reasonable. So now we could like to move to slide 21, which is a discussion about the therapy thresholds. Uh, we had the therapy caps uh, back in 2013 all the way to 2018. And in those, uh, I wanted just to emphasize that these caps or now thresholds are not things to limit the care that is being provided to the beneficiaries. It's very important, to, and it's particularly in my mind as a physiatrist, that everyone gets the rehabilitation that they need and that they, the, the activities that are provided are of a complexity in their skilled activities. Therefore, there are reasons to exceed the therapy thresholds. The, for, there are two major reasons to exceed the therapy thresholds are is that an evaluation is necessary. So you, if you don't know what is going on and you have a concern or a report of, a, of an issue that's occurred with the beneficiary or an order regarding therapy, but they've already exceeded the therapy threshold, then evaluation uh, is in documentation may be considered reasonable and necessary. That is uh, one of the main reasons to have an th exception to the, the therapy thresholds. The second reason is that the documentation of the therapy services need to be shown that they are reasonable and necessary. So if you're gonna continue with the additional therapy to exceeding the therapy threshold or the therapy cap in the old days, there needs to be sufficient documentation. And as it's reported in the, the regulation, it has to be justification in the medical documentation of why you're exceeding the therapy threshold or the therapy cap. What is required is documented or, or outlined in the Medicare Claims Processing Manual, Chapter 5, Section 10, where it talks about what documentation requirements you can provide to explain why somebody needs to exceed the therapy threshold. The first is the discussion of the condition of the patient, and I'm going to go into that in a little more detail in the next slide. But that includes the diagnosis, complexity, and severity. So it's very important to first start with the documentation and discussion of what condition of the patient you're dealing with. Therefore, again, getting back to the original slide and coming in a circuitous loop, is that you need to look at medical necessity. If it's, is it reasonable and necessary based on the diagnosis of the patient? That's why in a plan of care, the diagnosis is the first thing on the list. It may be the left hemiparesis. It may be the genuine recurvatum. It may be um, the impaired uh, or the neglect or the dysphagia. Regardless, having understanding of what the specifics of the condition is, is very important in documenting the exception to the therapy cap. Simply documenting decreased strength or endurance, decreased function, would may be examples that are uh, showing insufficient documentation. And as a reviewer, I would see that as insufficiently documenting what really the condition of the patient is. Then when you're documenting the therapy thresholds is to document the type, frequency, and duration of the therapy. Again, the same goes back to the issue of the plan of care and in the issues of medical, reasonable, and necessary. When you're just documenting that exception to the therapy cap, writing in a general statements such as they need five times a week for the next four weeks or 12 weeks is not a good way to start, in my mind, the way to, to document the, that if things are going to be reasonable and these services are necessary. And then the last intertwining of the, the factors of the documentation after you've got the condition and you've wrote down how much and how long they're going to get the therapy, it's the interaction of the current active conditions that are directly influencing the treatment. Let me give you an example of that. It is not uncommon that I see a, a laundry list of diagnoses, such as the patient has uh, hypertension, they have diabetes, and uh, they have a uh, mood disorder. Uh, if those factors are not active conditions that directly and significantly influence the treatment of the patient, it's 
of little effort to write down or to, to figure out why those are actually even there. If the diabetes is associated with a peripheral neuropathy and they have decreased proprioception and sensation, then it may be important. But it's important that you intertwine those active conditions and not simply write a laundry list of activities that are being or uh, diagnoses that are in the chart, but intertwine that into the condition of the patient. And I also want to just point out on the very bottom, it's important to recognize that most conditions would not ordinarily have the exceptions to the therapy cap. That actually comes out of the IOM. So the documentation and the burden of uh, proof needs to come with the uh, efforts that you are receiving, that the, the beneficiary is receiving therapy that is reasonable and necessary, and that it, these are one of the other conditions and not one of the most conditions that ordinarily would not exceed the therapy cap. Now I'd like to move to slide 22, which uh, just describes this discussion a little bit more of the condition. And because this seems to be an issue that I've seen in documentation on a repetitive basis. And it goes to the issue of, of how to describe a condition. And it doesn't mean you have to write a novel. So for example, the beneficiary has a left hemiparesis. That would be the diagnosis. Then they have spasticity and contractures. That's the complexities. Then in their left upper extremity, they have a Brunstrom stage level four with a modified Ashworth three and the lack of range of motion of the wrist and elbow of such and such. Those are descriptions of the severity. As you can see that the, 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 the writing of this condition of the patient doesn't require a novel. It does require focused writing of the diagnosis, the complexities, and the severities that uh, the beneficiary has. And by doing so, you can provide sufficient documentation, or more likely than not, provide that sufficient documentation to show that things are reasonable and necessary and, and eligible for the Medicare coverage. Now, if I can move to the last two slides as I uh, close this loop of documentation understanding. We started with the issue of medically necessary and reasonable. Then we moved to the issues of, of what do you write down in the plan of care? Who writes the plan of care? Then we discussed the issues of skilled versus unskilled therapy services. And then now closing back onto the loop, you know, of whether you took the pathway of rehabilitation or maintenance therapy, it doesn't matter. Then closing this loop of understanding is to always rely on the description of the specific injury or illness that the beneficiary has. It is not uncommon as well for me to see documentation of somebody that has uh, been started in a therapy program and they just had weakness or debility and they were not really specifically identified in the records. So the key is, is to paint this picture of what the beneficiaries' impairments are, not simply their disabilities, but what are some of the specific impairments that the beneficiary has, and then intertwining that in with the functional limitations that they have and how you want to describe that and the implementation and the integration with the therapy program. Is, and I will also reemphasize the issue of discussion of prior level of function that those things need help in establishing what the beneficiary's potential and prognosis is. If the, the prior level of function is based off self-report and you don't have anything else, you have uh, the potential of having a weakness in the documentation. And it's okay to be able to document. This is our understanding of what the, the documentation is. I would admonish you that when you're writing prior level of function, write down when that was last attained so that you're not documenting something that was three years old, but maybe within the reasonable period of time prior to the initiation of the course of therapy that you're trying to produce now, maybe a couple of months or whatever, because that will support the medical necessity of the evaluation in the terms and the documentation of objective descriptions in that are 
essential and to me uh, very significant in the assessment and review of the documentation. And then if I can go to the last slide, which is slide 24, I would like to just uh, close on the fact that this documentation really rests on the fact of establishing goals, of where you really want them to go, that the long-term goals. That's why the plan of care doesn't require short-term goals, but it does require the long-term goals. Because the significance is, is that you're trying to document the positive effects of the therapy and the benefits and trying to reach those long-term goals. That's also why the plan of care, if it's a significant change is made, that's why it's defined as the change. If you change a long-term goal or you change a, a, a condition of the patient, those could be significant changes to the plan of care and they need to be reestablished and recertified. But a short-term goal doesn't meet that standard. So you, you can change short-term goals and you can move along. The key is always working with the documentation of, of the plan of care, the prior level of function, and using that as a key piece of information to establishing that if the, the reasonable expectation that the therapy that is being provided will have a direct and significant impact on the recovery of this beneficiary. So. That's why it also requires the assessment of those psychosocial aspects that we discussed previously. And if you can go to the last slide, I will we'll come up on the, the resources and handouts that are available uh, for that have been addressed in this uh, lecture. And